Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Patrick Tande, Governing Council Member of ICOG. I'm very happy to host some of the most leading practitioners in Ubijeva and for today's event. This is part of the TOG experience series, and today's program is focused on polycystic ovary syndrome, specifically what's new in both adolescent PCOS as well as the general management of PCOS in the light of the new HA guidelines that have been published. I'd like to welcome our two very eminent faculty who are here as chairpersons today. First and foremost, we have Dr. Varsha Basri, madam. Next slide, please. Namaste. She's somebody who is well known to all of us. Recently, she has fought and won the proxy vice president election. But she's also known to us in fertility circles in Maharashtra as the first person who gave the C and PGD baby of North Maharashtra way back 20 years ago. She served as the president and secretary of the National Covid Divine Society. Of course, she's been chairperson for the Foxy International Academic Exchange Committee. She's received a host of awards, including the Among the Possibly Puraskar by the Honorable Governor of Maharashtra, the Anandi Bai Joshi Award, the Foxy Champions Award, and she's also received the Foxy Excellence Award as a Foxy chairperson. Thank you, ma'am, for sparing time from your busy schedule to be here with us. Next slide, please. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Tadmi Kaneja. She's been chairperson for the ISAR Delhi chapter. She's also the president of Obijiva and Society, the state scientific chairperson at several conferences which have been organized in and around Delhi. She's also a working member of the Ego Working Group on Breast Diseases. She's had a host of awards to her credit. She's also served as the chairperson for the Foxy Press Committee or Ms. years back, president of the Muzaffar Nagar, the Bijiva and Society, also president of IMA Muzaffar Nagar, Bharat Gaurav Samman Award, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Excellence Award, and a host of other awards as well. Most recently, she's won the Foxy Late Dr. D. Kutti Award, which is a Lifetime Achievement Award, and I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Tarani Kaneja to our program. Our first speaker... Thank you so is, much, Pratik. Thank you so much. Yes. Our first speaker is a dear friend who I've known in fertility practice since several years, and she's somebody who is well known to all of us in fertility circles. She's actually come here simply because I have invited her. She's been refusing a lot of invitations going to be busy with practice as well as with her family. And thank you very much, Dr. Jyoti Bali, for being here with thank us. You. Can I refuse, request Dr. Varsha Basti to please introduce our person? Yes. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be with you all. Dr. Pratik Tambe, I'm really obliged and honored by your invitation. And I'm really happy the TOG has taken a very apt subject, PCOS, and the topics also, the speakers also, like Dr. Jyoti Bali and Dr. Pratik Tambe. I'm really, really happy to attend this very, very important uh, uh, topic. And I'm really happy to be chairing the session along with Dr. Tarini Taneja, who is a known figure from Delhi. And Dr. Joli, Jyoti Bali, a dear friend, and she has been into ART from since long. She's a director of Baby Soon Fertility and IV Center, Fellow Reproductive Medicine, Bangalore Assisted Conception Center, and Kamirira Hospital. Ex-consultant, unit head, Fortis uh, Hospital, founder, secretary, Delhi Gaini Forum, vice president, TGF Central, secretary, Delhi SAR in 2019-2020, joint secretary, national IMA women being recipient of Nang Shakti Award and eight national women excellence award, Pride of India Award for expertise in, uh, in 2015, F APJ Abdul Kalam Appreciation Award from Delhi Gaini Forum in 2018, she has received. And so she has received Economic Times Inspiring Gynecologist of North India Award 2018. So with this brief introduction, may I introduce Dr. Jyoti Bali, who is going to talk on PCOS. And we let, we are really eager to um, uh, listen from you, uh, Dr. Jyoti Bali. Over to you. And thank you, organizers, again, for giving me the opportunity to be present in this August gathering. Thank you. 
thank you, Varsha, ma'am, for this kind introduction. And of course, I couldn't say no to Pratik, though for last one and a half years from my family commitments, I have not been able to go anywhere. No conference, no lectures. So, Pratik, thank you so yeah, much lucky. for this invite. <laughs> One second. Pratik always comes with a very good, nice, very good uh, topics and uh, excellent academician. I really love to attend all his topics and all his mm -hmm. webinars and whatever uh, academic Same programs. Here. I'm really Same here. Uh, highest of regards for this great academician and a good friend. Yeah. Uh, is my screen visible, Pratik? Pratik. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. The topic uh, okay. today, Pratik had asked me to speak. Uh, on was adolescent PCOS and I think uh, my basic practice is for infertility so this segment I thought if we, it is these girls if who are identified early tomorrow we see them into our practice so if counseled early detected early I think it will go a long way when we see them in our practice it will be their weight will be sorted out there are a lot of other issues which will be sorted out if they are you know picked up on time counseled on time and treated right from the beginning where it starts uh, why am I not able to? One second, Pratik. You can use the arrows on screen. Uh, one second, I'm calling somebody to help me out with this. There is no Over. arrows. Be comfortable. One second. Not moving at all. Control. One second. We had checked it. It was moving. Now it's not moving. Just give me one second. Yeah. So this PCOS, we all know that it's the, one of the most commonest uh, endocrine disorder. Incidence of PCOS is 8 to 13 percent in women. Why this varied range is there? Because, you know, it depends upon the ethnicity and the method of testing. And sometimes it is not really, you know, that we test this population. So we know. So the incidence reported in the literature is this gap that 8 to 13 percent. But with time and with technology advancing, with you know tests being done and often the awareness is there for this. So more and more rising incidence of these adolescent PCOS. 3 to 4 percent to 19.6 percent of adolescent girls, depending upon the diagnose, diagnostic cr criteria used and the population study. It is a familial condition and heritability is approximately 70%. 24% positive family history. If you find that the mother has had PCOS, there is a good likely chance that you will see it in the daughter also. It runs in the families. In the first degree relative, daughter of a woman with PCOS had been reported to have a five-fold increased risk of developing PCOS. Now, WHO defines adolescent PCOS as the period between 10 to 19 years of age. What are the challenges that we face in diagnosis of adolescent PCOS? Why there is always a dilemma? Because in PCOS and adolescents, normal pubertal symptoms like irregular cycles, acne, seborrhea, weight gain, increased hair growth, all overlap with the PCOS symptoms. And in adolescents, both menstrual irregularity and hyperandrogenism are required for diagnosis. Not recommended, well, I will be talking about it in my slides to come. Additionally, the time from menarche to full maturation of the reproductive axis can be variable. Post menarche, which may bridge young adulthood, AMH is physiologically high in adolescents. Therefore, it cannot be a marker to diagnose PCOS in these young girls. PCOS in adolescents may be the earliest manifestation of metabolic syndrome. It may later evolve or be associated with obesity, GDM, hypertension, type 2 diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, endometrial hyperplasia, and malignancy in later in life. So common pitfalls, the labeling of an adolescent too early, and yet failure to identify a child who has multiple risk factors. So a very balanced approach towards, you know, picking up these girls, labeling them and counseling them, treating them and taking them forward to, to their reproductive years or perimenopausal or postmenopausal years is a whole spectrum that one needs to look at it as a gynecologist if you see them in your OPDs. <laughs> what are the risk factors? Premature puberty before eight years old, which is very often seen these days because of the diet change, climate change, or other factors that are working towards it. Obesity, family history, 
and ethnicity. It is more common in the African American population compared to the Asian, though it is not much of a difference in the incidence there also. Risk factors for assessment of PCOS, intrauterine exposure to androgen excess, intrauterine growth retardation has been reported, high BMI, insulin resistance, family history, persistence menstrual irregularity, presence of PCO on ultrasound, clinical signs of hyperandrogenism, early persistent severe, frequent relapse in acne or moderate to severe hirsutism for more than or equal to two years. It could be a progressive course, it could be a regressive one. Full blown picture of adult PCOS could be seen, but evidence is contraindicatory in this case. Risk for progress of adolescent to adult PCOS, persistent irregular cycle six years after menarche, if present, yes, it can be a full blown PCOS in adulthood. Persistent end ovulatory cycles three years after menarche and increased BMI there. Pathophysiology, we all know this theory, but I, I have still put up the slide just one second. Uh, I put up this slide because this is the basic pathophysiology of PCOS. Genes and lifestyle, there is insulin resistance of PCOS, hyperinsulinemia, where, you know, this high, how it works. So pituitary LH is high and FSH is low. So there are hormones with, with uh, mediators which are working from the liver, SHBG, and uh, uh, the insulin growth factor. And the ovarian theca cells produce increased androgens. So this is the whole cycle which works towards the pathophysiology of PCOS. And we all know that the hormonal derangement in, in, with increased LH that follows the hyperandrogenemia from the theca cells, conversion is uh, deranged. And this is how it presents in PCOS. So this is again the uh, representation of this uh, two cell, two gonadotropin theory, where there is theca cell and granulosa cell, where the whole derangement happens, right? Beginning from the conversion, which is deranged here. So decreased FSH, increased LH from the theca cells and then to the granulosa cells. So this is the diagnostic criteria which has been used and the Rotterdam criteria being followed at present for the adults. But when it comes to adolescent PCOS, in the last decade, there have been three, three consensus meetings, but the final decision was to follow, follow the NIH criteria of 1990. So specific and very strict criteria for adolescents remains irregular menstrual cycles plus hyperandrogenism and or hyperandrogenemia should be the only criteria when it comes to adolescent PCOS. And we cannot apply the Rotterdam criteria. AMH cannot be used because it is high physiologically there in the adolescent. So AMH marker has no value. Ultrasound cannot be done because if it is transabdominal ultrasound, the sensitivity and specificity will not be great because of the fat. And TVS cannot be done in these young girls. So transrectal is also not recommended in the guidelines. 1990, the first diagnostic criteria, as I mentioned, the 19 uh, NIH criteria is being used. Menstrual irregularities, ovulatory dysfunction, and hyperandrogenism, once other conditions that mimic PCOS have been excluded, which I will present in the end of the presentation. What are the other, diagnose, other differential diagnoses when you see PCOS and you want to rule out other reasons for it? So irregular menstrual cycles in this adolescent group, how do we define? post menarche less than one year, irregular cycles are normal because there's a pubertal transition that is happening. This axis will stabilize after some time. So more than one year, if 90 days for any one cycle, if there's a gap, this should be noted. More than one and less than three years, less than 21 or more than 45 days, this is an irregular menstrual cycle. More than three years, if it is there with less than 21 days or more than 35 days or less than eight cycles per year. This is a criteria there. Primary amenorrhea by age 15 or more than three years post thalarchy breast development. This is the definition that has been given for irregular menstrual cycles in, these, in this age group. This is again the representation of the same what I had just spoken as to how to uh, look at these uh, adolescent group. Menarche, unable to diagnose PCOS, first year post menarche, diagnose PCOS if there are irregular menstrual cycle, more than 90 days, any cycle, menstrual cycles less than 21 days or more than 45 days. Primary amenorrhea, three years post thalarchy. Diagnose PCOS if the menstrual cycle is more than 90 days, any cycle less than eight years, less than 21 days or more than 35 days. And hyperandrogenism is an added feature for diagnosis clinical and or biochemical. And again, repeat, do not use pelvic ultrasound for diagnosis of PCOS and ultrasound. So ultrasound and AMH, two factors, cannot be used to diagnose PCOS in this particular age group. 
isolated hirsutism acne or, and or alopecia is not diagnostic criteria severe acne no university accepted visual assessments for evaluation severe or progressive hirsutism hyperandrogenism how it has to be looked at there is a certain way of evaluating hyperandrogenism clinical features need to be first seen as to what is the type of hirsutism hyperandrogenic features that the girl has and then biochemical markers hirsutism we all know that we use the modified ferrimin and galve score nine site assessment is used in the modified ferrimin and galve score more than 4 to 6 on the modified score depending on ethnicity more than 3 in white and black women more than 5 in mongoloid asian population percentage is more important than the severity alopecia of course ludwig score assess severity and distribution frontal and temporal hair loss should be noticed and hyperandrogenemia as per the ashray guidelines if clinical hyperandrogenism is unclear high quality assay should be used liquid chromatography mass spectrometry extraction chromatography immuno assay should be used direct ft assay should not be used because it has poor sensitivity accuracy and precision radiometric or enzyme linked assays but preferably liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry is what has been recommended so calculated free uh, calculated free testosterone or free androgen index or bioavailable testosterone is recommended use upper limits for reference ranges hormonal contraceptive must be off for 3 months when this evaluation uh, biochemical evaluation is done patient should not be on oral contraceptive for last 3 months so the formula they have given for free androgen index is uh, 100 by uh, 100 into uh, 100 into total testosterone upon shvg level normal range should fall between 7 to 10 ultrasound criteria should not be used in less than 8 years after menarche high incidence of multi follicular ovaries in life stages and ovarian volume should be taken up if it can be but ultrasound has just not been recommended for the adolescent pcos as a diagnosis so it should be avoided because in this picture might confuse with pco picture but this certainly does not you know ask us to label this patient with uh, adolescent pcos so this ovarian morphology may be present in uh, some of these young girls but it cannot be labeled as pcos again amh should not be used i have already spoken about it no well defined cutoffs have been given and it is physiologically high in the adolescent population insulin resistance compensatory hyperinsulinemia or obesity should not be considered as diagnostic criteria for pcos in adolescents at risk of pcos if only irregular cycles or hyperandrogenism ultrasound is not indicated symptomatic treatment should be taken up regular reevaluation is important menstrual cycle reevaluation after 3 years post menarche should be done because first year it may be just a transition phase where the axis takes time to stabilize in the very first year of starting of menstruation ultrasound evaluation after only after 8 years post menarche has been recommended so how do you evaluate this uh, pcos patient clinical assessment detailed menstrual history should be noted down ask them to maintain a calendar hirsutism using uh, ferrimin modified ferrimin galve score acne you have to observe note acanthosis nigricans patches on the uh, neck the velvety patches should be noted as a sign of higher increased insulin resistance clitoromegaly alopecia and ultrasound of course has not been recommended in the adolescent group but for adults yes it is it is to be done and fsh lh testosterone prolactin tsh only for differential diagnosis it is useful and metabolic assessment will be body mass index waist hip ratio lipid profile oral gtt insulin fasting fasting and 2 hour after 75 gram glucose but not in these young girls in the beginning so cutaneous evaluation will be cutaneous manifestation physical examination should document uh, terminal hair growth acne alopecia acanthosis nigricans skin tags if there are any obesity bmi calculation measurement of waist circumference should be taken note of and this was just one article which i came across quite interesting saying that you know fetal milieu affects obesity risk trouble at both ends of the birth weight spectrum when there's an iugr baby born or there's a overweight baby born both will be you know at risk of developing this pcos note down because of the body image these young girls are prone to depression screening for depression and anxiety by history and if identified referral and or treatment may be indicated because of their body image because of you know uh, acne alopecia weight gain 
these children sometimes are body shamed in their school colleges and they need to be spoken about that this is not a disease, it is a genetic endowment and how to manage this uh, treatment for this adolescent PCOS is very, very important. Counseling these young girls and their mothers and the parents, it's important here to note down these kind of features because this will go a long way. Now, this is something which, again, the history needs to be uh, asked because this may not come forth without asking them. Sleep disordered breathing, obstructive sleep, asking them for this symptom also is important because overweight, obese adolescent for symptoms suggestive of OSA when identified definitive diagnosis using polysonography referred for it, and they can be put up on this machine, which is, uh, you know, utilized by these patients. I forget the name of that machine, which is used. I just... If I remember, I'll talk about it. Uh, what was it? Sleep ap it is uh, for sleep apnea. They use a kind of a machine where there's oxygen supply given through it, and you utilize it in the night when you're sleeping, and it really improves your, uh, you know, uh, the features for this obstructive sleep apnea. Type two diabetes mellitus. They are at high risk for such abnormalities. And HbA1c, OGDT and HbA1c, if unable, willing to complete OGDT, rescreening after three to five years, more frequently if central adiposity, substantial weight gain and or symptoms of diabetes develop. Cardiovascular risk, screen for CVD risk factors, family history, cigarette smoking, hypertension, dyslipidemia, OSA and obesity. Increased abdominal adiposity should be taken care of and noted down. Subclinical hypothyroidism may be concealed in this, this group, so they should be investigated for autoimmune thyroiditis. Treatment will be objective, symptomatic, restoration of body weight, cycle regulation, reducing signs of hyperandrogenism, prophylactic of long-term health hazards. Later, they might be prone to these kind of things. They might come to you as infertility, metabolic syndrome, obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. So it's a full-blown spectrum which these patients, these girls are going to be prone to as age advances. So at risk should be treated, acne, obesity, hirsutism, and irregular cycles. Lifestyle therapy, overweight or obese, weight to 2 to 5%, testosterone levels to decrease by 21%, resumes regular ovulation 50%. Calorie-restricted diet should be advised. No evidence that one type of diet is superior. Beneficial for both reproductive and metabolic dysfunction during adolescence, an important factor that conditions the evaluation of ovarian function. Anti-obesity medica medication, again, is very, very uh, controversial and subjective. It can be considered with lifestyle, uh, considering the cost, contraindication, side effects, availability, and regulatory status. It is not that, you know, we can prescribe these medicines straight away. It's a cross-referral should be taken and under supervision only if there is a gross uh, need for it. Right as a first line management uh, for obesity, it is not advisable. Exercise improves weight loss, reduces CV risk factors, diabetes risk, 60 minutes per day, moderate to vigorous intensity, three times per week, muscle and bones uh, strengthening. Now counseling, this kind of a thing, just telling them will not work. It has to be a very intelligent counseling on this as to you know what is her schedule, what is her hobby, Ask her to join, you tell her to exercise, she'll say, okay, fine, will not adhere to it. So one sport, maybe in school or after school, one hobby, one sports club she can join. And somewhere or the other, if in her daily routine, it can be fixed by walking to school or coming back, walking or evening, some activity where, you know, it ensures that it is her hobby as well as she does it with her own will, will be the way to counsel instead of just telling her do this exercise. So it will have to be incorporated in her day-to-day -day lifestyle. So exercise interventions we all know about, but in this group particularly, it won't work just telling them the exercise at this much minutes or this much calories. I think it needs to be incorporated by the mother or by somebody to help her out, or the counseling has to be a little more tactful than it can be for an adult PCOS. Avoiding alcohol, smoking, psychological stresses in normal weight girls, pre prevention of weight gain, monitoring of weight, increasing physical activity, and effective in reducing the development of metabolic syndrome if she is not overweight when she has come and been labeled as adolescent PCOS. So the differential diagnosis that I was talking about, I have put up in this chart form, evaluation for uh, adrenal hyperplasia, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, 17 hydroxy progesterone early morning. If levels less than 200 nanogram per deciliter, CH is excluded. If more than that, 
200 more than 200 ACTH stimulation test can be taken up. If it is normal, it is 21 hydroxylase deficiencies excluded. If it is abnormal, it is more than 1000 nanogram per deciliter. CAH can be labeled because presentation would be overlapping clinically. Then this is what has to be taken up. Evaluation for DHES, it has limited role, but then here DHES can be used only when there is specific for adrenals. So less than 300 microgram per deciliter, it's normal. 300 to 700 PCOS or CAH, more than 700 suspect adrenal tumors. First line of pharmacological therapy, CO, uh, combined oral contraceptive pill alone. But there are cases where there are younger girls where the bone uh, epiphysis is, closure has not happened. There you can also use only progestin seven to 10 days or even cyclical progestins can be used should be considered in an adolescent uh, first line as COCP with clear diagnosis of PCOS for management of clinical hyperandrogenism and or irregular menstrual cycles. Who are at risk but not yet diagnosed with PCOS for management of uh, clinical hyperandrogenism and irregular menstrual cycles. BMI, if less than 35 kilogram per meter square with no specific metabolic and or CV abnormalities, any type, Choice according to the preference of the physician and patient specific clinical characteristics of the patients to be considered. COC should be prescribed with caution because there is a side effect of it also. So which one to use, how to use, we will talk about it. If contraception is needed, alternative measures such as progestin only methods can also be considered. No COCP preparation is superior. Use lowest effective dose, 20 to 30 microgram of ethanol estradiol or equivalent uh, COCP. It con COCP containing levonorgestrel, norethestron, or norgestimate con uh, associated with lowest risk of DVT. So 35 micrograms, 30 to 35 micrograms of ethanol estradiol plus citroton acetate is not the first line in PCOS because it has higher DVT risk. Should only be used when treating moderate to severe hirsutism or acne, most androgenic progestin, levonorgestrel, norethestron, low androgenicity, norgestimate, and uh, desogestrel. Progestins with anti-androgenic activity should be uh, taken in, drosperidone and CPA and Dinogest. Second line pharmacological therapies will be COCP combined with metformin. It should be considered with management of metabolic features where COCP plus lifestyle does not achieve goals. Could be considered in adolescent PCOS where BMI is more than 25 kg per meter square. COCP plus anti-androgens can be considered after 6 to 12 cosmetic treatment plus COCP. If they fail to reach hirsutism goals with androgenic alopecia, anti-androgens reduce exc uh, androgen excess features more than metformin in monotherapy. Spironolactone is the most commonly used one, but it's level C evidence there. Anti-androgens should be used when contraceptive measures are guaranteed. Metformin should be considered in adolescents with clear diagnosis of PCOS, at-risk symptoms of PCOS before diagnosis is made. Most useful when BMI is high, and high risk in high risk uh, patients with uh, metabolic syndromes. Metformin does not promote weight loss in obese adolescent PCOS. In overweight or obese adolescent with PCOS, beneficial effects have been seen. In non-obese adolescents with PCOS and hyperinsulinemia, it improves ovulation and testosterone levels. Inositol should be considered experimental in this particular age group. It is of not of much use. Duration of COCP or metformin not yet been determined unless the patient is gynecologically mature, that is five years post-menarche or has lost a substantial amount of excess weight. To conclude, I would say that diagnosis is important. Early and accurate diagnosis is essential. Criteria for the diagnosis differ from used for adult, irregular menstruation plus moderate to severe hyperandrogenism and or hyperandrogenemia, clinical or biochemical, clinical and or biochemical. Exclusion of other causes of hyperandrogenism with menstrual irregularities to be looked into. Metabolic, cardiovascular risk, psychological, dermatological. Treatment should be individualized depending upon age, symptoms, risk factor, and choices. First line should be lifestyle modification along with uh, combined oral contraceptive pills. Second line could be adding of metformin where there's metabolic syndrome there. And anti-androgens only if hirsutism features are there. And metformin alone has not been advised. Thank you so much. So picking up of this uh, adolescent girls and label them and treat them, it goes a long way.
Thank you, Dr. Jyoti Bali, for such an elaborate, exhaustive, and informative talk. I am really happy to witness and to chair this your session. Full of knowledge, full of updates, and how to predict, how to diagnose the Rotterdam criteria and the FG score. You rightly said four to six is diagnostic, not more than eight, but it was the old uh, theory. And also, you have told us the risk of PCOS. Every alternate girl is nowadays coming with metabolic syndrome, PCOS, and how to diagnose it, what is the treatment, when to use metformin, when not to use COCPs, to, uh, how to avoid DVTs and whatnot. Everything you have managed and you have to, you have also given emphasis on lifestyle modification and how weight loss will help her achieve better, um, avoid uh, the risk of uh, having other complications. You have already also told in uh, emphasize that sonography is not of use and AMA should not be given that much importance like uh, adult uh, PCOS patient. So I'm really happy to witness an exhaustive, elaborate presentation of adolescent PCOS, which is just the tip of iceberg we are uh, at present uh, um, uh, witnessing in the society. The, all the uh, mothers and uh, girls are really worried and the depression is uh, mounting in lips and bounds. And it is really a social stigma for them. And it is a social problem nowadays uh, of NCPs that NCDs, one of them is PCOS, adult and PCOS it should be looked forward and we should um, encourage the parents and the girls also to, um, uh, to have good motivation and pharmacological support is very, very important. Spinal tank acts very well on these hirsutism patients and you have also um, given emphasis on CAT, that is, C CH, that is very, very which was very, very important to notify the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pratik Tambe for giving me the opportunity. And thank you, Dr. Jyoti Bali. Really, I'm really happy to chair your session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vachai Baste. Pratika, would you like to share your screen? Dr. Tarini, can you please introduce the next speaker? Thank you, Thank you Pratik. Pratik. Please, I could read adolescent PCOS because my population is infertility major majority of them. Thanks Thank you, Dr. Jyoti Bali, for being with us. Please stick around for the Q&A. If there are any relevant questions, yeah. we will take it at the end of the second term. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Should I invite Dr. Um, uh, Tarini Tareja to introduce Dr. Pratik Tambe, who is the second uh, speaker for this um, uh, TOG. Dr. Tarini, please I'm introduce here. Dr. Pratik Tambe. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Baksha. I'm here. I'm just looking for the CV of Dr. Pratik. It's not coming. Point <laughs> madam. I think I'll nahin, go ahead with it. Should, want... should I read it for Do... you then? I can, I can see it here. No, I am able to see, but it's small. If I do it, it's a little bit more. Anyway, Dr. Pradeep, everybody knows he doesn't need any introduction. He's very, very academician. He's more than 40 years in the very, very academician. He's more into academic. I don't know, does he sleep or not? Every week, he is with a, a new webinar with a very good take home masses for the doctors to update and also for the public interest. And this PCOS again is very, very useful for the public interest. So Dr. Pradeep recently elected as a governing body, governing council member, and he is also in the Maharas Council. He is being the chairperson of the Foxy chair and Dr. Barsa, I would like, please you read. I am not able to see. Yeah. I don't know. I think that's so, enough. No, no, that's enough. No, let me introduce Dr. No, Pratik Tambe. It, it is my, uh, I am really uh, delighted to introduce Dr. Pratik Tambe. He is a ART consultant, gynae endoscopic surgeon from Ashirwad, IVF Mumbai. International Diploma Holder in Advanced Laparoscopy Surgery from France, trained in Assisted ART in Belgium, trained in Clinical Embryology in ICSI at London and Singapore, Chairperson of AMOX Endocrinological Committee. He has really done wonderful work during 
2023-2024 and governing council member newly elected. Uh, um, congratulations, uh, Dr. Pratik, for that. Veteran and managing council member. And he, uh, he has also been elected with maximum number of votes. Uh, and um, he is a um, uh, managing committee member, Indian Society of a uh, ISAR, managing committee, Maharashtra chapter ISAR, managing committee member, Maharashtra chapter ISAR, again, recipient of 30 MOGS among ISAR, Foxy prizes and awards, blah, blah, blah. Editor of 24 books, four Foxy focuses, handbooks, and 11 key practice program, contributed more than 100 chapters. Pratik Tambe, uh, you are all welcome, and he has received so many awards and whatnot. Uh, so now he is going to talk on new horizons in PCOS management. So over to you, Dr. Pratik Tambe. We are eager to listen to you. Thank you very uh, much. Thing, Dr. Dr. Varsha, thank you so much, Dr. Varsha. Uh, one thing more, he is a very, very humble person and friend of the France. Pratik, thank one you, thing. Thank you so much. That thank machine you. is called BiPAP yeah. machine for, CO, yes. uh, for <laughs> sleep apnea. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I couldn't remember the name. You made me humble also. Thank you so much. <laughs> so thank you very much, dear friends, for being here with us today. And I'm going to try and focus on the newer horizons, the new guidelines, and the new evidence that we have when we talk about PCOS management. I'm going to assume that my screen is visible and I'm positive, and I'm going to go ahead. When we Pratik, first started, it is being... visible. Only talk little louder. Right. When we first started these TOG experience series and the series of webinars with different scientific backgrounds and different topics in the pandemic, we had absolutely no idea that it was going to become such a super duper. In fact, we regularly have more than one thousand five hundred viewers, even though it's in the afternoon. It's something which we do on a weekday when there are a lot of people who are already at work. And even today, we have over 800 viewers who are visible and they are live in log day. So when I'm asked, why did we actually start all this? I um, usually like to go back to this beautiful quote from Aristotle, which is more than 500 years old, and where he said that education is an ornament in prosperity. It's a refuge in adversity. It basically started because we wanted to see our friends while we were locked up in our rooms or in our clinics during the pandemic. And we were all isolated and we wanted to feel normal. We wanted to establish some amount of normalcy during the difficult period of the pandemic. And that's how we started this entire journey. It's continuing. I hope more and more of you will join us over the period of time. You will get informed regarding practical recent advances which you can implement in your own clinical practice and hopefully your patients will also be benefited as a result of these educational events that we do thanks to the efforts of our academic partners and also Science Integra who are our scientific backbone for all these events. If you look at recent papers, this is one of them which is published in Human Reproduction and this is probably the largest ever Collation of evidence from 194 countries, which looks at polycystic ovary syndrome, how the trends have changed, how the global disease burden is now different compared to what it was 20 years ago. They begin by saying that about 1.5 million new cases are being reported globally. And of course, this is from 2017. I'm pretty sure that this data is relatively older. Many more new cases are being reported. Again, the onus of reporting is not on us in countries like India. It's not something which is required by law or it's mandatory. For example, if you have somebody with malaria or typhoid, that's a notifiable disease that needs to be reported. PCOS is not a notifiable disease. And therefore, I'm pretty sure that this data is not accurate. Be that as it may, I'll just go ahead and show you how things have changed as compared to 15 or 20 years ago. There is an increase of 4.5% from 2007 to 2017. The global age standardized incidence of PCOS is now as high as 82 for 100,000 population. This represents an increase of 1.5% in just 10 years from 2007 to 2017. So you can see that the numbers are increasing significantly over a period of time. And even in countries like India, 
these numbers are shooting up in astronomical proportions. This is the most recent HDA guideline, which was published last month. It's freely available on the HDA website. It's public domain. You don't have to pay for it. You can download it. If you can't find it, please feel free to send me an email. I'll be happy to share it with you. And if you find that the 200 plus pages of the guideline are very boring, laborious and tedious to read, which it is, unless you're an academician, then you can go to these synopses. And this is a lovely paper by Helena T. Rittal, who are actually the workers behind that exhaustive guideline. And they've summarized the most important recommendations in this paper. Again, this is something which is freely and easily available. If you can't find it, then maybe I'll send it to you. Many of these recommendations have already been covered by Dr. Jyoti Bali in her talk, and therefore I'm going to skim past the parts which are reputations, and I'll try and focus more on clinical practice guidelines and other newer evidence, because this is already being covered, and I don't want to make it tedious and boring for the audience. The one big difference in the ultrasound criteria, as per the new guideline published last month, is that besides follicle number, per ovary or FNPO, which is used in anthropological follicle counts. There is also a new criterion called as follicle number for cross-section of the ovary, also called as FNPS. And this is a new marker, which is supposed to be more diagnostic and more accurate for women in the diagnosis of PCS. Again, the old criteria of ovarian volume continues. And again, as Jyoti mentioned, in adolescence, follicle numbers for ovary are not possible to do because we can't do a transvaginal scan in Indian patients who are adolescents. So these criteria are only for adults. Again, you need to have a standardized 8 megahertz probe, which is used. Transvaginal sonography is not to be utilized. The clinical presentations are well known to all of us, and most commonly patients will present to you with one or combinations of these issues. One of the major issues which are now cropping up in 2023 are mental health issues, which briefly Ruti has touched upon, and we will talk about a little bit. So, how do you diagnose your hyperandrogenism? The first and most important thing to remember is that not all androgen excess is equal to PCOS. It's very easy to overdiagnose PCOS. It's very easy to forget that there are other conditions as well which can mimic androgen excess, notably ovarian tumors, etc. And that has been covered in the previous talk as well. So as far as the clinical assessment is concerned, you need to have your perimen Galway score, which is there in place. For male pattern baldness or alopecia, you have something called as a Ludwig score. And you need to have a modified perimen Galway score of 4 to 6 to detect hirsutism. This was actually devised way back in the 60s. And I don't know many of us who use it in clinical practice, but this is an excellent tool, especially to judge the response to anti-androgen therapy because it's a long-term treatment, takes six to 12 months, bare minimum, to show any improvement and visible benefit for those patients. As far as the biochemical assessments are concerned, the tests that are recommended are the newer LCMS assays, which are liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. These, of course, are not widely available. Where they are available, they are extremely expensive. And most parts of India, we still use the older ELISA tests, which are not very accurate. When the, with that being said, should we actually do these tests in the first place? Or are we just adding to the burden, the cost burden to our patients? They are actually not something which are recommended widely, but I feel that they should be done at least once to ensure that you are not missing a non-PCO cause of androgen excess. You cannot use these tests to judge the response to therapy, by which I mean if you've started the patient on the pills or spironolactone, and you want to see whether the patient is getting better, you are not going to measure androgen levels. You are not going to measure your DHEAS, SHBG, and testosterone because the levels may be far different from what you visibly see. Your perimen Galway will give you a better, accurate assessment of whether your anti androgen therapies are working. Having said that, 
I feel it's also important to remember that we were taught something way back in our undergraduate and postgraduate tours, and that's the imbalance between the hormones, FSH and LH, which actually leads to your androgenesis. This is our two-cell tubonidopropyl theory, which all of us have studied. This is our Tika cell, this is our granulosa cell. And we know that because in PCOS, you have an overwhelming preponderance of Tika cells, you're going to have excess of androgen precursors, DHEA, endosteinidam, testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, which are going to be circulating around and because your SSBG levels are low, and excess of free testosterone. That gives rise to the entire cascade of androgen excess with the attendant complications, which will come to in just a couple of minutes. So what is the impact of this androgen excess on the body? What happens is the female pattern is gradually converted into a male trunkal and abdominal adiposity because of your androgen excess. And of course, along with your excess androgens, you're going to have not only abdominal obesity, but also insulin resistance, alteration in the hepatic and the reticular endothelial system function. South Asian PCOS is now recognized as a unique subset of PCOS. In fact, all the papers which you read in international journals, the guidelines, they all focus on Caucasian PCOS. And these patients behave very differently from our Indian or Asian Indian patients, so to speak. We have an excess of hirsutism with a lower SHBG, there is a higher free androgen index, there is greater amount of insulin resistance. We have a resistant patients who don't easily respond to oral ovulogens when we come to fertility treatment. And even some patients you will find they are gonadotropin resistant. There is a much greater prevalence of acanthosis migricans because the skin is completely different from Caucasian patients. You will find that the BMI is significantly higher. And at a lower BMI, we are sarcopenic. Therefore, we have higher concentrations of central visceral adipose tissue. Now, this central visceral adipose tissue functions like an endocrine organ by itself. Because of this, patients have a more early onset of metabolic syndrome. If you remember in our undergraduate and postgraduate years, we were taught that unopposed estrogen for 20-25 years is finally what results in syndrome X or metabolic syndrome. Today, we are able to identify and diagnose metabolic syndrome even in young girls, girls who are adolescents. And that's because of the different ethnicity and the different subtype of PCOS that we see in Indian patients. As I said, these patients can be resistant to plummeting, they can be resistant to letrozole even, sometimes even gonadotropins don't really work. When you finally make them ovulate, which is what we were taught all along, that ovulation is the problem, we are now encountering women who have altered endometrial receptivity and they have lower fertility as well. So that's something which we are now coming to terms with. It was not recognized 25, 30 years ago when we were students, but this is something which we have to deal with on a daily basis. I've just reproduced the lifestyle modification the recommendations from Asia. These have been covered in the previous talk. So I'm going to skip past the practical tips and the correct advice with periodic reinforcement is what is going to be beneficial for these patients. That is your and my role as the clinician and the counselor. It's very easy to say, go and run 10,000 steps. Very easy to say, do treadmill three times a week until we ourselves set an example to our patients and we have periodic reinforcement and that's not really going to work. And that's true for all of us. Nobody tells you and me to go and exercise three times a week. Otherwise, because you're 50 plus, you will drop dead one day because of the coronary. We need that advice. All of us need that periodic reinforcement. And trust me, even your patients need it as well. As far as diet recommendations are concerned, again, these have been covered. So I'm going to skip past these. Some amount of caloric restriction is beneficial. There are various dif different diets which are available, which have been shown to be of benefit in patients with PCOS. I'm not a dietitian. I'm not a nutritionist. So I'm not going to focus on that. What I will say is that a high protein diet, 
seems to work well in combination with good amounts of judicious exercise, at least 120 to 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week. The most mil important million dollar question that we need to answer as clinicians is whether we can tackle the basic pathology at PCOS. PCOS today is something which is widely prevalent. Most of the medications that we prescribe are aimed at controlling the disease. There is no permanent cure, and that's something which you need to sit down with the patient, discuss, and at various different points in her reproductive career, she is going to need the appropriate advice, and she is going to need handholding from people like you. So let's start by talking about whether we can control this androgen excess. We would love to. Unfortunately, we are not able to try as we might because most of the medications that we prescribe only tackle the effect. They don't tackle the cause of PCOS. Maybe someday there will be a targeted gene therapy which will look at the reasons why this androgen excess occurs and that will be able to actually cure PCOS at the root cause. Until then, all we can do is treat the effect and look at the various metabolic derangements, try to keep them in check. We know that there is altered insulin sensitivity. We also are aware that there are abnormalities of glucose metabolism, and all of these lead to the attendant complications, which over time lead to metabolic syndrome. What is now known, and that's something which is coming up over the past seven to eight years, is that the androgen excess influences certain molecules called as adipokines. And these adipokines function through the visceral abdominal fat or the central trunk of obesity. They disturb your intracellular mechanisms and they cause a vicious cycle of obesity. So the only way to break that is to have regular exercise, caloric restriction and insulin sensitizer. Which insulin sensitizers work well? We'll come to that in just a couple of minutes. This visceral adipose tissue now functions like an independent endocrine organ. And there is a multitude, there's a long list actually of cytokines and adipokines which cause local chronic inflammation. And these reactive oxygen species are the ones which cause issues for patients in the long term. So you have a resistant insulin resistance, as I said earlier, and we are not able to tackle this because of the vicious cycle. We've already covered this earlier, so I'm going to skip past these slides and go to the actual treatment with modalities that are now available to us. Since I practice in fertility, I'll talk a little bit about fertility concerns. We've been taught that women with PCO have difficulty in ovulating. There are now various reasons why even after they ovulate, the fertility is not all that great. One of those we touched upon briefly, and that's the altered endometrial receptivity. Now we are also being made aware that there is some defect in the signaling, whereby your follicular recruitment and selection itself is hampered, and that leads to what is called as programmed cell death or apoptosis, which occurs on a greater scale, and your follicles which are being generated, they themselves have poor inside quality. Now, this is something which we were not aware until a few years ago, and therefore, it is probably necessary for us to have some mechanisms or some medications which will try and improve the inside quality in these patients. Another new concept which is coming up, and we rarely talk about it, is that women with PCOS are now experiencing premature ovarian insufficiency or premature ovarian failure, whichever term you want to use it. And the reason for that is because of multiple cycles of stimulation given by people like me who are fertility experts, the number of follicles or the good oocytes which are there are getting exhausted earlier and earlier. We have previously taught that women with these who have lots of follicles, they will never have premature ovarian failure or premature menopause. We are now seeing women as young as 35 who are diagnosed PCO and they have very poor levels of AMH and interfollicle counts of 1 and 2. So premature menopause is also happening in these patients as well. And that's something which is very thought provoking. A few simple pointers as to how we can treat these patients if they present with irregular cycles. 
and they are less than 17 years of age, just give cyclical withdrawal bleeds once every three to four months, a simple progesterone challenge test typically works well. With your lifestyle modification and insulin sensitizers, sometimes the disease can be kept in check, but some patients will require low dose OCs to be given cyclically in addition to your myonacetol, decarbonacetol, or metformin, whichever you prefer. Again, this has to be an informed choice which is made between the patient, her caregivers, and you. Typically, if she's an adolescent, then she's not going to be able to choose. And therefore, that is where your expertise at counseling and taking the parents or the caregivers into confidence comes into play. About hyperandrogenism, we covered this a little while earlier, and Ashley also suggests that COCs are the first line, and you can use these in adolescence as well if your other basic treatments are not working. It's important here to realize that when you prescribe second line antiandrogens like your spironolactone, glutamide, and finasteride, you must counsel your patients that they should avoid conception because the second line antiandrogens are not something which we would recommend in first trimester pregnancy, they are not allowed. Therefore, you should have efficient contraception also at the same time. This is part of the PLG algorithms, which we did a few years back, and I've just reproduced it here for your knowledge. Another concept which is important and which we must remember is that there is defective signaling intracellularly in these patients who have PCOS. Your second messenger is not working well. In the second messenger in your glucose metabolism is something called as PI3 kinase and your glucose 4 is what is not functioning well. So you need something which works at an intracellular level. Remember metformin, which we've used for 50 years, works on the insulin receptor, which is a cell membrane receptor. If we had something which worked intracellularly, that would be the perfect way to go. And we do have something that works intracellularly, that's called minus and decarbonates. So are there any simple protocols that you and I can use in clinical practice? These are the QOG algorithms which Oxy did along with Samson Tegla a few years ago. Again, these are public domain. These are easily available. They're there on the Oxy website as well. And in case you can't find them, please feel free to write to me. I'll be happy to share them with you. So they look at different ways of treating both patients who are presenting with infertility, patients who are presenting with obesity and high BMI, and patients who need treatment for hirsutism and acne, which can be quite disturbing. There are some new recent developments, and this is actually the guideline development group which worked on the guidelines for acanthosis nigricans. We were led by Dr. Gurusha, a past president of Foxy, current president of the PCOS Society of India. You'll see me somewhere in the background. We had a host of other organizations also contributing to this, including ICMR, the Mumbai Society, the Endocrine Society of India, and also the Dermatology Society. So this guideline is being published in the Journal of Association of Physicians of India, JAPI, very soon. And please look forward to it. This is adapted from the most recent updated evidence available worldwide, including international guidelines on acanthosis nigricans, which, if you remember, we were always taught is one of the pathognomonic factors to diagnose PCOS. As far as morbid obesity is concerned, more and more patients are presenting with obesity, which is refractory to the regular treatment. So, we offer these patients treatments like bariatric surgery. Are there any other medical options that are available? Are they actually viable in our Indian population? That's the subject of a new guideline on obesity, which is under the first species of ISAR. We are working on it. Hopefully, in a month or two, we will be able to publish those as well. We did these protocols for practice in 2019 when we were led by our toxic president, Dr. Melita Balshetra. This is a picture from the Managing Committee meeting. We did a lot of important things there. And we put together the most recent updated available evidence. And we put it together in the shape of a checklist. We also did a seven-step counseling guide in association with the International Aware Group. Again, for reasons of paucity of time, I'm going to skip past these slides. 
these are again available on the Foxy website and will be able to see these very easily download them from the website. The new evidence regarding insulin sensitizers is the last part of the talk. And I'd like to take a couple of minutes to remind you that we have agents which are functioning intracellularly at a microcellular level. And these are called inositols. Since I come from infertility, we are aware that those patients where the follicular fluid is deficient in inositols, usually there is poorer glucide quality and there is less chances of fertilization and implantation of the embryos created from those two sites. If you prescribe myonositol and bicyronositol, they are supposed to lead to better site quality. There are plenty of papers for this. They've done this study by retrieving follicular fluid, subjecting it to chemical assay. And of course, you can see that when supplementation has occurred, you get better quality embryos, which leads to better clinical pregnancy rates and life birth rates. Prescription of these newer insulin sensitizers is being shown to reduce the duration of stimulation, the amount of gonadotropins which are consumed, lesser amplitude of FSH, improved pregnancy rates, and of course, better insight and embryo quality. Again, the new recommendations by ESHRA now no longer refer to inositols as experimental. They say that these can be considered and they have lesser side effects as compared to metformin, which is known to cause GI issues, but that is something which is a conversation between the patient and your clinician, and that has to be offered to the patient. Document that choice and then go ahead. N-acetylcysteine is something which is now coming more and more into prominence because it is supposed to be a good antioxidant. Remember, we said just five minutes ago that in women with PCOS, there is greater programmed cell death or apoptosis and acetylcysteine has anti-apoptotic activity and therefore gives you better follicular recruitment and better suicide quality also has anti-cytokine effect. In fact, there are small papers today which show that it improves suicide and embryo quality, gives you better clinical pregnancy rates. This is one paper from Taiwan which says that women treated with N-acetylcysteine have better clinical pregnancy rates after ART. I'm very happy to announce that my most recent book on drugs in OBGYN and reproductive endocrinology was just released a couple of days ago. And this is actually here as a slide in this talk, not just for advertising the book, because I actually wrote a chapter on a new insulin sensitizer, which is now available to us, and that's called Berberine. Berberine reduces the insulin resistance. It alleviates your abnormal lipid metabolism, decreases chronic inflammation, improves your reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress, reduces your anti-androgen levels, and therefore it improves fertility outcomes. There are plenty of small papers. There is a meta-analysis which is there in my chapter. If you go back and read the book, you'll find that women who have been prescribed for berry have much better waist circumference significantly better improvements in lipid parameters as compared to metformin, which is considered the reference drug. Also, the waist hip ratio is significantly better in patients treated with berberine when compared to metformin. Your HOMA IR insulin sensitivity, all of these are much better in patients who have PCOS and who are treated with berberine. We as yet don't have extensive studies and data from Indian patients, but I would appeal to all of you to please use this new agent in your clinical practice. Try it out, maybe put your data together, publish it, and maybe this will be something which will be one of the newer alternatives that we can offer our patients. Just like 10 years ago, when Mayo and Gikaro this first, first came in, they were met with a lot of skepticism. Every new agent that comes in and says, okay, I'm the best, I'm the best is going to be met with skepticism. The proof of the pudding is always in the eating. Unless we try it in our patients and we find improvement, we are not going to be able to suggest that this is something which works very well in our Indian patients as well. This is another study with 150 patients. Again, they found that berberine significantly affects the Roma air, decreases fasting glucose, decreases free androgen index, total testosterone within a short period of just 
well be. So pre-treatment for two or three months before you run your index or your treatment cycle seems to be the order of the day. And there are patients who have been undergoing ART and they found that the FSH consumption is lower, fertilization rates are equivalent, and clinical pregnancy rates and live birth rates are significantly better with lower side effects when compared to metformin. So I'll close, ladies and gentlemen, with a few simple, important take-home messages at the end of the talk. PCOS is now the new hidden pandemic. The most common complaints that women present with today are not infertility, which was the case 20 years ago. More and more patients are coming forward in the adolescent age group with acne and hirsutism. Therefore, you need to have a multi-pronged, multidisciplinary approach Lifestyle and exercise is something which we all advise, but that doesn't necessarily translate into action by the patients. We need to set an example for our patients. Continue reinforcement. Remember that insulin sensitizers and exercise are in the mainstay of treatment besides the other drug therapy that we offer our patients. Pleasure in our jobs puts perfection in the work. And if we guide our patients in the right way at the right time, Utilizing the correct medications, I'm sure PCOS is something which we no longer need to fear because we have so many different things today in our harmonium Thank you very much for a patient hearing. I'm happy to take any questions. Before so, the uh, chairperson gives her concluding remark, Dr. Tarini, I would like to put one or two words. Uh, fantastic presentation as usual, Dr. Pratik Tambe. The semaglutide we are using nowadays, but uh, the, we stop it and again the patient gains weight and also it is costly also. There is new uh, drug uh, in the, uh, like Barbarin. Barbarin is quite uh, old drug, I will say. It was vanished in between uh, through the market and again reappeared. There is another one new drug has been introduced recently and it is far, far more better than semaglutide. That is what, so we are awaiting the results also. Uh, so I'm really thankful. I thought I should uh, attend your talk because always there is some take-home message definitely hidden somewhere in your talks and academically oriented. In your updates, always you are give, giving us and we are really, you, know, you enthrall the audience like today also we were very happy to attend it. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Tarini, and thank you, Dr. Pratik Tambe, for giving me the opportunity for thank this you. TOG. Thank you so much. Thank you, dear Varsha, for giving the like, platform to speak something about the Dr. Pratik. I'm <laughs> really, it's always a pleasure to listen to Pratik. As you said, we always get some new messages and something very new about the topic. So that's why I know my peak hours, I agreed Temptively, yes, I will attend because these are the, in the art place very, very peak hours for the practice. So I, I could know one thing more to you. Like I used to think there is a only the culprit for the increased androgen is the peripheral insulin resistance and fat, fat cell. And third thing he said, the visceral obesity, visceral fat, is again a, act like an organ to produce the endorphin. So I just think so many things I could learn more from both the topics are very, very good with the updated lifestyle and everything. So I think so, how to, I mean, the uh, health public, I used to go in the school for this uh, lecture for the awareness. Because our purpose is to know, to update only, to deal and to give the better treatment, rather best treatment to our adolescent reproductive age group of patients. So with the awareness I'm doing already, so I believe everybody's awareness is very important in this factor. Second thing, what about your experience for the intermittent fasting in reducing the fat? Have you any experience for that? Because I think Intermittent fasting is decreases the glycogen level because it used the stored fat for the energy. And also it also in, decreases the insulin level. It, hyper, it decreases, balance the hyperinsulinemia and also balance the hormones, ghrelin and the cell leptin levels. So somehow it to balance the fat and 
try to rejuvenate your mental health and physical health. So that I wanted the experience from both of you, from Varsha and Dr. Pratik Tambe. Uh, but it's more like the follicle numbers you told. So with the 3D and 4D like probe I'm using, so many times we get at least more than 10, 12, 14. I try to like focus on the peripherally arranged only. Even then, many times we confuse with the report of the uh, like from the other ultrasonologists. So how to tackle with that? That is my question. Though you had told that we should see the follicle number and per ovary and follicle per cross section. That is very important. But how to, I mean, educate that the ultrasonologist? Everybody is getting from the machine, maybe the very simple machine, many the BMS are doing, technicians are doing under the cover of the uh, educated and qualified person. So I don't know what to do. So every person is being treated, every girl is being tortured by treatment of this. So the simple Please answer you. to that but is... is not getting, yeah. The simple answer to that, ma'am, is that if you use a transvaginal probe of 8 megahertz in an adult, as we said, you cannot use this in an adolescent in India. Yeah, but for the reproductive life, the patient is married and coming to that, that's we can I'm use. To, yeah. Yes, I'm coming. So the cutoff today is 20 follicle number per ovary when you use an 8 20, megahertz yeah. probe. And this with is this something machine, which sorry, is easily with, with achievable. Is a any machine you can use, but it has Basic to be an machine. 8 megahertz probe. Okay. And it should and be peripherally you, arranged. That is the yes, important. And you will easily get 20 because with the newer probes that we now have, compared to 20 years back when we had 3.5 megahertz, you can easily get 20 follicles per yeah. ovary in patients who genuinely have PCOS. Because now with these probes, you can pick up even 4 and 5 millimeter follicles, which once upon a time we could not see. That criterion is very easily fulfilled. At the same time, as you rightly pointed out, when you look at peripherally arranged follicles, you can exclude patients who have multicystic ovaries or physiological excess follicles which are seen during the time of adolescence. At the same time, you will be able to get a more accurate number because on transabdominal scan, you are not going to be able to see these. I think that takes care of a lot of operator error and subjectivity that is there as part of the diagnostic process. Yes, sir. So, so Pratik has told the ASRM has given the guidelines of 20 for in each follicle. That is very, very diagnostic, not 10 or 12 or 15, 20 and above. That is diagnostic of PCOS. So it is very easy now. And another, the, I, I like the, your question about intermittent fasting. It is really, really helpful according to physiological. Um, uh, Can I just uh, say one a, sentence? A, I'm a, sorry a, to interrupt. Of... Just one sentence. Yeah. But... Intermittent fasting is something which is new for Western civilization. In India, we've been practicing intermittent fasting for centuries together because all of our women fast on various religious functions. Half the month they are fasting. So that is intermittent fasting in clinical practice, in actual practice. I'm sorry I interrupted. Please go ahead. Nowadays, modern, modern India is like westernized. They are eating, uh, the eating habits have changed too. Definitely, it does have the value because it really, uh, the sugar levels, uh, intermittent fasting will, sugar giving inflammation. So that is cut out with, with the intermittent fasting. Definitely, the person feels energetic, the brain uh, works well. Well, is more energetic depression. So all the side effects of PCOS are really vanishing with the intermittent fasting. So what I tell my patients, kuch nahi hota na, just two bar khana ka obas baake bhi isme dana bhi nahi khane ka. So that definitely helps and it becomes a simpler version for them as a treatment and prevention of PCOS. So you really brought very good to a question, Dr. Tarini. I congratulate you for that. Intermittent fasting is here to stay and it is the answer for PCOS or metabolic all syndrome because I have seen myself also, even my brother who was uh, uh, advised taking insulin, he is off medication and the weight also balance uh, occurs and it is physiological and it is easily achievable also. So thank you, Dr. Yeah. Barsha, Dr. Prati. One thing more, like from the Foxy, how can do we do the extensive advocacy? 
from the take the help from the government for the playgrounds and for the this fast a piece of food that is literally harming the uh, generation yes sir with the full of the salt and so many preservatives so how can we deal that is the main culprit if you go in the market it's a full of the like a uh, counter of the food counters everybody is eating pizza khana khane ka aawaz ghar ka khana khane ka aawaz to wo wo how to deal that and we so i think all of us we need to remember and? that as doctors and clinicians it is also our job to educate our patients yeah it is important for us to go out in the community go to schools and colleges I maybe go, once I go or twice much. a year Public try forum. and absolutely try and educate these young people about what is the best practice as far as diet nutrition exercise etc is concerned but, but then that is something which you can do maybe once or twice in a year in one individual school or college around the year remaining 48 49 weeks the benefit of whatever we have said is not going to be there so that periodic reinforcement is essential for which there has to be a mass media campaign which is going on around the year whether we yes, are able to do it in our thing, individual Patrick, capacity uh, i would like to have that book that you have recently published with uh, nandita parshetkar and that is our take home message Madden. it's there on congratulations Amazon. dr patil i already thank congratulated you. i was there so i want to that's why i'm saying the extensive advocacy at the government level because as a person i can help a one drop is literally matter in the ocean but we need extensive uh, this advocacy for the playground and strict hours in the school should be for the outdoor activity so that's going to help us for the urban i would, I would yeah. agree dr jyoti is there the, listening to us i'm what about the waiting for the artificial intelligence it can do if it can help us artificial intelligence hopefully in ai long... <laughs> will be able to guide our youngsters better in future much better than we can whenever yeah. we talk to them dr jyoti there's a question from the audience and i'm coming to the audience q and a part of the program there is a lot of discussion on coins and q10 in pcus now neither i nor you have talked about it so i felt maybe we can address this do you think it improves metabolic and endocrine issues in women with pcus yes coq has been of late you know been advocated for all these patients but if nothing else at least the energy levels in these patients they always come back and say that the energy level has improved i agree i think this is something which probably all of us would benefit from taking coq not only patients who have pcs because yeah. it's a mitochondrial energizer yes there is a question regarding the protocol for treatment of pcs and infertility i think that's the subject of an entire program by itself so we'll do that on another day what is the difference between lean and obese pcs do you want to take that lean and obese pcos see you will feel you will see both the spectrums in your clinic even in adolescent pcos even in infertility population so it is the lean pcos and obese pcos of course the lifestyle management and weight reduction will be the first forte to you know help achieve all the other goals but whereas lean pcos though they look very easy to you know uh, deal with but sometimes even they feel you get lot of resistant lean pcos so with them it is more difficult at times to deal with stimulations and infertility practice but in adolescents of course the metabolic syndrome other things can be managed much easier compared to uh, the obese pcos thank you ma'am and one last question we have and that is other than metformin is there any other insulin sensitizer which is recommended for the treatment of pcos so i think i touched upon all of them what is currently available in our basket what is been proven to be scientifically effective in our patients is myo and dipyrone is it all we've seen n-acetyl cysteine we've seen melatonin also though melatonin itself is not yes. supposed to be an insulin sensitizer and the most recent new kid on the block is berberine for which we have a lot of hopes hopefully that will transform our practice melatonin and vitamin d3 in pcos has been recommended yes yes because absolutely. melatonin works directly at the oocyte level Yes, absolutely. So I'd welcome any closing remarks. Thank you, organizers. Thank you so much. Patients are now using melatonin as a combination where the poor responders do. Yes, I agree. Doctor Vachan, do you think patients use melatonin? Doctor Jyoti, yeah. Doctor Jyoti, so yes, after a long, we could see you, and it was good presentation. 
पैंडेमिक my gratitude to glisen our educational partner we are the makers of veritol which includes berberine also iv mag and injection i3 which is magnesium sulfate and iron isomaltoside respectively two fantastic chairpersons dr varsha baste and dr tarim taneja thank you so much for being with us despite your busy schedules hats off to jyoti for her amazing talk on adolescent pcs and i'm not going to pat myself on the back for another of course you should <laughs> congratulations but to i you, hope it was beneficial to everybody congratulations you. both the in fantastic speakers really excellent we talk. really loved it attending everything thank you so many new bye. Bye. doctor bye. Bye for now. just uh, just tell me about the uh, this uh, you said the berberine has uh, come so yes. it, is it available it's available widely ma'am in all major metro it is safe it's very safe it's effective it's actually based on a herbal preparation and it has much lesser side effects as compared to metformin of course as i said we don't have much indian data and that is why i appeal to the audience to start using it to publish that data so that we have valid good indian data that we can show the next time we talk about this one. so if it is available i'll try to on my patient also Definitely. with the taking the consent if we are yes. trying on you so Absolutely. what is the dose can you highlight to me i will speak to you how... about it a little later okay. Okay. okay so i think we'll call this program to a close until next time goodbye god bless thank you everybody for joining in and i hope thank you, you gained some practice points from the program bye bye, bye.